There's a lot to be learned in the world of esoteric theology and occultism, but I find that most people's first step happens to be this one, the Kabbalion, or at least in some roundabout way, the Seven Hermetic Principles. I mean, it makes sense. It's a catchy title, almost everyone and their dog knows about it, and it was flaunted haphazardly by the various public occult movements as of late. Yet, I assure you, that has nothing to do with their simplicity of form and depth by comparison to, let's say, Kant's reasoning for his categorical imperative. However, almost needless to say, the seven hermetic principles are still relevant and decently worthwhile for introducing metaphysical concepts to a person that might have otherwise never come close to such a thing. They're phenomenally straightforward and may be segmented comfortably into three major ideas, the mind, you, and physical matter, much like alchemy. Further, these three ideas have relationships to each other, like in every other occult doctrine, but they're tightly packaged inside the teachings of the principles. For example, the idea of supernal similarity to the human experience is akin to as above, so below. Rather, the idea of correspondence. But if that example didn't make any sense to you, then don't worry, because by the end of this video series, you'll be a fully-fledged hermetic initiate with a Nimitonian seal of approval. And eventually, we can tackle the nitty-gritty details from such spaces considered important, like history or reasoning. Anyways, I want to thank you all for joining me. My name is River, and welcome to the Nimiton. Let's get started. First, we begin with a stance on the validity of the seven principles. The man in question, one Mr. William Atkinson, purported these principles came from an unpublished, well-hidden, likely nowadays considered gifted by the Anunnaki, scroll, or a collection of written works. That doesn't sound very likely, but don't worry because as I said, this is a stance on the validity in relation to Hermetic tradition, which if you've been around my channel, you'll know that I made a brief piece on the opening segments of the classic Hermetic work, the Corpus Hermeticum and how the various principles actually do show up inside the writings if you look for them. However, that video is very boring. In short, they aren't blatantly obvious, but they are present aside from some of the extended explanations or ideas we find inside the Kabbalion itself. Otherwise, we'll just have to take William's word on the remarkable source material. Not that I would, but we'll take it from there. Now, we can go ahead and start discussing and dissecting the principles themselves. As I said, you may have guessed there are seven universal laws of reality and spirit from the Kabbalian side of the Hermetic tradition. And as the text may claim, all of them work from a top-down perspective. These seven principles, laws of reality, or characteristics of nature are in order. Mentalism, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, and lastly gender. So we begin as it begins, with the principle of mentalism. Let's provide our relevant axiom, the all is mine, the universe is mental, which would be found in chapter 2 of the Kabbalion. As we may note within the axiom, mentalism has two layers. One is a spiritual concept, and the other is how our brain engages with our environment, how it deals with reality. Starting with the all is mind, we can say that on a supernal or spiritual level, mentalism purports that the entirety of the cosmos exists as a mental form from a divine being. We can look for overlap in these teachings with my personal favorite being the Kabbalah. So that which we call the cosmos or physical reality exists within the mind of a characterization known as Zir on Pin, the formative agent of Etz Heim or the Tree of Life. So we have a very smooth connection. However, we're missing a particular detail. The Kabbalion states that everything exists within the mind of the All. A decent idea of a monocentric divinity. Does the Kabbalah have such a teaching? Interestingly enough, yes it does. The supernal intelligences, being the three Sferoth at the peak of the Tree of Life, are of the body or machinations of Arik Ampin. 
whose peak is noted as Aye Asher Aye, rather the I am that I am state of divine being, which we will find in the opening segments of the Zohar for a better understanding. For quotation, using the Berg translation for convenience, which is Zohar Elef 1 1, a spark was inserted into a circle, and it showed no color at all. From within the spark, a fountain sprouted and emanated two faces of a teak. And to 2.6, now the brightness, which is a recon peen, has a ye engraved on its sides, meaning I am, and Asher, a portion of its center. So you may be thinking, well that didn't explain anything. However, it actually has a special item within it. Asher, or that in this phrase, is a concealed chamber because Asher is formed of the same letters as Rosh, meaning head. Therefore, anything that comes after this head exists within this head, as in we exist in the mind, the Rosh, of a Rikampin, who is called at times beginning, rather Bereshit, the opening word in the Torah. And it says in the Zohar, because its name is the first of all. So now you might cleanly see a correlation, an extended example of mentalism from a spiritual perspective. But let's not completely lose ourselves before we get both sides of the explanation. Mentalism's second aspect is that of us and how we relate to reality. Or rather, the experience of living and interacting with our environment. This segment of understanding is from the second portion of the axiom, the universe is mental. Let's dissect it with an example. When we look at an object, we begin noting its qualities. As in we look at the color, we compare past experiences, and may suppose that its surface is smooth, rough, or some other quality of form. These are perceptions. They are the mind's engagement with the object. It takes into itself information through the eyes, comparing it to previous uses of the other senses, and makes an assessment of the object in question. Therefore, the universe is mental. Your mind's assessment which forms your own personal reality and ideas. Of course, there is another example, which involves other thinking people. When a person acts in such a way, our perception of it is more pertinent than it might seem in a more ultimate reality. We may say, a person's perceptions are their literal reality in these regards, and they will respond to those perceptions according to their own values and inclinations. I'm supposing that you understand the two aspects of mentalism more clearly, so let's take a small jump into our more full revelation. If the supernal nature has a means of some higher reality within its mind, whose inclinations of perception is a true reality, an ultimate reality, then it is reflected into the universe as it is. And we, also having some quality of the same, enforce our perceptions onto that physical space in which we live. Even our understanding of divine forms and supernal ideals, therefore, the two are almost one and the same, only differing in degree, but that's a talk for a later principle. However, this seems sufficient for now, and we might say therefore, the all is mind, the universe is mental. I hope you enjoyed this talk on mentalism, and I'll see you soon for the other principles broken down in this extended format. They won't change your life, but they'll change you which will probably change your life. As always, a massive thank you to my supporters, friends, and patrons. I appreciate you more than you know.
This has been River at the Nimitan. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.